Well, thank you so much for being here tonight and for the invitation. We look forward, my wife and I, to this weekend for a long time, and we're grateful for this church, for Dr. Phillips, for Greenville, and the witness of Reformed churches that, that are here. There has been a kind of literature that is almost unknown today that has had a checkered history throughout church history, a literature that combines the wisdom of a seasoned pastor with the questions of a young convert. That was true in ancient church, even more true in medieval church. It was revived a bit in the time of the Reformation. Perhaps the most famous of these books was a book written in the heyday of the medieval age, one of the best books written in the medieval age, Why God Man, by a man named Ambrosius. Now, this man was asking the question, why did God have to become man and suffer and die? What is the necessity of the cross, our theme tonight? But the whole book is a dialogue between this seasoned pastor and a young convert. And the young convert is having a really difficult time trying to comprehend why it is absolutely necessary for Jesus to become man and to die. And at one point, the author gets very frustrated with his young convert. The young convert's name, by the way, was Bozo. And it sounds like he has a little bit to learn, doesn't it? And he says to Bozo, Bozo, you see, your problem is you can't understand the necessity of the cross and of grace and of the gospel because you don't understand the enormity of sin. And so in one way, we could say, well, the answer to the necessity of the cross is simply in the word sin, and we cannot solve the sin problem ourselves. None of us can, and therefore, I can sit down, because that's the answer. Sin, original sin, actual sin, sins of omission, sins of commission, our bad heart and our bad record that flows out of our bad heart necessitates the cross because no man can save himself. We need someone to come in our place to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. But we need to grasp that. We need to marinate in that truth. We need to, we need to plumb some of its depths, though we can never get to the bottom. And that's what I want to stammer a little bit about tonight. From 1 Timothy 1, I invite you to turn with me to verses 12 through 17. And our message will really be focused on verses 15 through 17. But let's begin at verse 12. Hear the word of God. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who both enabled me, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And then here comes our text. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. 
now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Necessity of the cross really is the necessity of the gospel, which in turn begs the question, what is the gospel? Why is it so essential? So I'm going to look with you at several thoughts about this glorious gospel that Paul speaks of here. First, it's content, the gospel's content. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. That will be at least half of my time. Then I want to look at the gospel's reliability. This is a faithful saying. The gospel's scope is to be accepted of all throughout the world. That's our calling. And then the gospel's pattern. Why Paul became a pattern for the gospel. And finally, the gospel's doxology. Why we praise God for this glorious cross, this glorious gospel atonement. So to understand the necessity of the cross, we need to understand what the gospel is. And the gospel in the Greek language really is summed up in this one word, eu angelion, eu, which means good. And angelion, which means messenger or good message, a good and a glorious message. That's the gospel. Now, originally, in Bible times, the word gospel function for any good report, any good news that came in the context of life's big needs. Originally, it was particularly used of military engagements or political campaigns. When people would be waiting with breathless anticipation for the outcome of an uncertain event, which would determine the future of of many individuals. And so in battles, for example, people would climb up into towers and and look to scan the horizon for a messenger who might be coming from afar to bring a good report of the battle. In fact, if the man in the tower looked carefully at the runner who was coming to bring news, don't forget they didn't have other means of communication that we have in those days, it was said that the man in the tower with experience could tell by the runner's feet, by his very gait and demeanor, whether he was running with his legs kicking up in the air and joyfully, how the soldiers had done in their military campaign. And if the soldier was running with cheerfulness and alacrity, the messenger would go out from the tower. There is good news. Eoangelion. We have won the victory in war. And that's how Paul gets the message in Romans 10, 15, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Because by New Testament times, Paul and other New Testament writers borrow that analogy of that runner and say, this is what a gospel preacher is like. He comes with good news He comes with great rejoicing. You can tell it from his entire demeanor. He's got great news to bring, and the news is simply this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Just sinners, which is who we all are. This is our name. You don't need to hear your name from the pulpit because your name is sinner. But praise be to God, this is the good news. The good news is all about Jesus, all about the cross, all about his atonement by which he makes God and a sinner to be one together again. 
And so in New Testament times, this word taken from political campaigns, from, from uh, military conquests, now is transferred over to the holy war that a believer enters into when he wages war against sin and finds salvation in Jesus Christ and finds all his help and his hope and his total salvation in this one fact that Jesus Christ came to save sinners through the cross. And so the essence of the good news, the essence of the cross, is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about experience. It's not about eloquence. It's not about utopias. It's not about anything we have to do. He did not come to merely prepare salvation for us. He did not come to induce us to somehow save ourselves if we somehow accept him in our own strength. He came to save, to actually do the work, to save sinners. See, the gospel is not good advice. The gospel is good news of something that has happened. The gospel proclaims a completed salvation for us through the cross. He came. That is good news. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, who inhabits eternity, came, took on our humanity from the heights of glory and came into this dark world, came to visit rebels and enemies and sinners to save them. Now that's an incredible task. In fact, it takes God more energy, more involvement to save one sinner than to create an entire world. But that's why he came into the world. To do the impossible. To do what we could never do. See, there are two things that we can never do to save ourselves that God could only do for us through Jesus Christ. Two things that must be done shall God's justice be satisfied in saving us. And the first thing is the cross. He had to die. The wages of sin is death. He had to die to save us from our sins. There's no other way to be saved. As Jonathan Edwards said, a finite creature, even if you could live perfectly from today all the way to the end of your life, a finite creature can never satisfy the holy justice of an infinite God. Only a Savior who is utterly, radically infinite God at the same time suffers and dies in our nature as real man can satisfy an infinitely holy God. Only infinity can satisfy infinity. And beside all of that, you don't have a clean record. And even if you could live perfectly, you've got past sins. God cannot allow one sinner with one unforgiven sin to enter to heaven because heaven is a perfectly holy place designed and permeated by a perfectly holy God. If you miss understanding the holy character of God, you will not know the heinousness and dastardliness of sin. And if you don't know that, you won't understand, bozo, the enormity of your separation from God and the necessity of the cross to pay for sin. But not only did Jesus have to come and die, and is the cross necessary to wipe out our sin, but we also need to have a right to enter into eternal life, and that comes only through absolute obedience. If the first Adam had continued to obey past the probationary command of the covenant of works in Genesis 2 over a period of time, at some point God would have said, you passed the test and you have a right to eternal life and now you cannot sin anymore. 
But you see, that didn't happen. Adam did fall, and we fell in him. And the guilt of his sin is imputed to us, and the pollution of his sin is passed on to us. And so now, we're just sinners. And we can't obey the law perfectly. The law demands that we love God above all, nonstop, every breath we take in our entire life, that we love our neighbors ourselves, nonstop, every breath that we take in our lives. And by nature, we are never loving God above all. We are never loving our neighbor as ourselves. And so by nature, we are always sinning. Every tick of the clock, sin, sin, sin. If not by commission, by omission. By not loving God above all and loving my neighbor as myself. Now, here then are the two words to remember theologically. The passive, coming from the Latin word passio, which means suffering. The passive obedience of Christ. Suffering obedience. Think cross, which is the culmination of it. To take away our sin. The active obedience of Christ to obey the law perfectly. Jesus for 33 years loved God above all his neighbors himself. Every single second he never sinned. He didn't even have original sin because Mary was overshadowed by the miraculous conceiving power of the Holy Spirit. So the male and female seed did not come together to pass on original sin. Jesus had absolutely no sin. So that he could earn the right for eternal life for sinners who by grace put their trust in him alone for salvation. That's the savior you need. Passive obedience to die for you. Active obedience to live for you. And now to intercede for you at the right hand of the father to keep you saved as he has saved you initially. So he must preserve you and keep you to the end. So we need Christ to save us. It's impossible to save ourselves, impossible to keep ourselves saved. We are guilty on every side apart from Jesus. But in Christ, we are made righteous. And so when you become a Christian, what happens is You look to the cross alone for salvation, to Christ alone for salvation. And you trust in that alone. And the Father, by his grace, pronounces you saved in Christ. And all of his double obedience is imputed to you. And all of your sin is imputed to him. He takes your hell and he gives you his heaven. He takes your unrighteousness. And he gives you his righteousness. Now, the enormity of that is what Paul is grappling with here when he says, Christ Jesus came to seek and to save sinners of whom I am. He doesn't say I was, but I am chief, present tense. Apart from his grace, I'm just the biggest sinner in the world. Because Paul knew his own heart a little bit. You know, when John Bunyan was saved, he said, Paul made one mistake in the Bible. He said he was the chief sinner, but it was a mistake because really I am. And he said, if Paul had known the heart of John Bunyan, he wouldn't have said he was chief. He would have said I was chief. But that's really what every Christian feels deep inside. Isn't that true? You don't have to go out and murder people physically to feel you're the chief sinner. Every moment I don't live for his glory, I'm falling short. But you see, the beauty is of the gospel is that I have a savior who takes up all my sins, all my shortcomings. And so when I believe in him alone for salvation, God looks, when he looks down from his throne at me as a prostrate sinner deserving hell, He sees Jesus between me and him. Just like David when he looked down at Mephibosheth who was expecting to perish because the bloodline of Saul was running through his veins. David said, fear not Mephibosheth because I made a covenant with Jonathan, your father, 
that I would show kindness to his seed. And so when we're in Christ, you see, we believe into Christ. And the Father looks at us and says, I see you in Christ. And that is the only reason, and it's the total reason, the exclusive reason, why you are saved. Now, it's important for us, as I said, to, to understand the magnitude of our sin, to appreciate the magnitude of what I've just said about the double obedience of Jesus. Which raises the question in Reformed theology, exactly what do we mean when we paint man so bad that we say man is totally depraved? And is nothing in himself but a sinner. What does total depravity really mean? Well, it doesn't mean that we're always acting out our depravity as badly as we could possibly do it. Then we'd all be killing each other right now. Or we'd all be robbing a bank right now or doing something crazy. No, God has restraining grace even for unsaved people in his common grace. So what in the world do we mean then by total depravity? Let me give you five quick thoughts. First of all, total depravity is always connected with sin. And sin means you are missing the mark for which you are created. The bullseye. You and I were created for one purpose. To glorify God. We weren't created to be self-centered. We were created to be God-centered. And so every moment of our lives, we don't glorify God. We're sinning. We're missing the mark. Total depravity, in the very first place, means all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. We've all missed the purpose for why we're here in this world by nature. And so we're all just what Paul says we are. Sinners. Rebels. Failures. That's number one. Number two, Scripture teaches us that total depravity, like sin, is something that is primarily inward, an inwardness that stems back to our profound and tragic fall in Adam. Total depravity means that we have a bad record because we have a bad heart. There's something fundamentally wrong with who we are in the depths of our being. Jesus says it's not what a man eats and handles and touches that defiles a man. Not what goes into him that defiles him, but what comes out from within him that defiles and affects all he thinks and does. You see, that's our problem. We're children of Adam. And so the guilt of Adam's sin is imputed to us, but the pollution of Adam's sin is passed on to us from our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents. That's why you never have to teach a, 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 a young child how to sin. No parent ever had to teach a child how to sin against any one of the Ten Commandments. And every parent can say, I've seen my children sin against every one of the Ten Commandments from the time they... Well, were babies. They're, they're already beginning to show their selfish character. And as soon as they're two, three years old, wow, sin just pours out of them in every way. You see, we are sinners. And that is part of our total depravity. Martin Luther said it so well. He said, original sin is in all of us like the beard of a man. We shave today and we look clear and clean, and tomorrow we get up in the morning and we look in the mirror, and our beard is growing again. It's breaking out again. Inward sin, our heart problem, is always breaking out in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. That's part of total depravity. Number three, what total depravity really means is that whenever we get a true look at ourselves as human beings, all of us fallen and polluted in Adam, there is something terribly wrong 
with every part of who we are. Not only with who we are inwardly, but something terribly wrong with every part of us. There's no element of our personality there's, that is no less affected by sin than any other. There's no part of us that God can look at and say, well, that part of you is good and clean. No. Our minds, our hearts, our consciences, our wills, which are like the citadels of our soul, are all enslaved by sin. Doesn't mean we're animals. Doesn't mean we're devils. But it does mean that there's no part of us that is wholly good. Every part of us is alienated from God. And number four, depravity. Depravity means that depravity itself lords itself over our lives. You see, by nature, we're sinaholics. And as believers, we're recovering sinaholics. Our state is recovering, but we're in the process in our sanctification of still recovering. We still sub back so often. That's part of our, our inward tendency. God complained of Israel, my people are bent to backsliding from me. Now, if you're a slave of something, that's a pretty grim picture. A slave, as you know, is his master's property. A slave has no time of his own, no property of his own, no talents of his own, no wealth of his own. He has no single moment of which he can say, now this is mine and my master has no rights over this moment. And so Paul says, by nature you are slaves of sin. Sin was your master. Sin lorded it over you. Sin played the king. You're in the grip of sin. That's what Bozo didn't realize. And that's the necessity of the cross, to be delivered from the grip of sin. We need Jesus Christ nailed to the cross to pay for the enormity of our sin. In five, total depravity spells that the wages of sin is death. If we serve sin, if we're not saved in Christ, we will receive the wages of sin. This is a moral universe. We live and move and have our being in the presence of a holy God. You sow the winds of unbelief, you will reap the whirlwind of destruction. You sow a seed of sin, you'll reap a harvest of judgment. It is appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment. Judgment is always intimate, the wages of sin is death. Hell. The lake that burns with fire and brimstone. You see, hell is a place where the smoke of torment justly ascends day and night forever and ever because that is the logic of sin. That is the divine response to persistent impenitence and final disobedience. Hell is what God thinks of sin. Unrepentant sin. But Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is why he came, to deal with cosmic sin. The only way our sin can be dealt with is by his agony, his bloody sweat, taking our death into the grave, tasting death for us, entering into the essence of the lake of fire for us on the cross, going into the bottomless pit for us, as it were, as our substitute, in our place, as our head, suffering the wrath of a sin-hating God. And what a price our Savior had to pay on the cross. That necessary cross for our hopeless condition. There he tasted hell. There he tasted separation from everything that was good. There he hung naked, shamed, cursed on the cursed tree. 
rejected by heaven, rejected by earth, rejected by hell, even rejected by nature. Even the sun won't shine upon him. He trod the winepress alone. No one looked at him and smiled and said, we understand what you're going through. The heavens didn't break open and his father said, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. The angels didn't come to strengthen him. The disciples, cowered and terrified, slithered away. No one catches his eye. He's an alien from his father's house. His friends, his brethren, have all forsaken his fellowship. Forsaken of men, and above all, forsaken of God. He enters the dark night of the soul. The sun won't even shine upon him. He's separated from all that is good. And lovely. He's abandoned by the cruel hands of the most merciless men on the planet. And even God, who has always been there to support and encourage him through his ministry, seems now not to be there. The unclean place with the putrid flesh all around the crosses, the passions of the mob, the sufferings of the soul, the distance of God. That, my friend, is sin. What the price of sin is, that is the only way we can be saved from it. That is what God thinks of you and your sin by nature. You know, there's a 19th century female writer by the name of Mary Wenzel, a very, very godly woman. And she said in her diary at one point, if my Savior had to come and suffer and die for only one person in the world, and that person were me, he would have had to go through all his suffering just for me. And you see, when the enormity of that sin becomes real to you, do you understand what happens then? Then the, th- the, the thorns in his crown are my sins. The spear that pierces his side is my sin. The agony of his being uh, scourged at Gabbatha, those 40 stripes or so are, are my sins. The crawling on the ground in the garden as a worm and no man is due to my sin. Then we understand the enormity of grace comes together with the enormity of my sin against a God who's never done me ill, a God who's never made any mistakes in my life, a God who invites me to come as a rebel, just as I am, and bow before him and receive his son as my substitute and the only substitute that could ever be accepted by God. Christ Jesus came. What a wonder. What a wonder. The gospel's content. But secondly, the gospel's reliability. This is a faithful saying. That's amazing. You know, five times Paul uses that expression. In those days, it was a Greek saying that was somewhat similar to what we would say today, as sure as there's a sun in the sky, so surely this or that happens or shall happen. In other words, without a doubt, it never fails. Christ Jesus came for sinners, and when sinners, by the grace of God, cast themselves entirely upon him and surrender to him and his way of salvation, it never fails. They are saved. There and then. Here and now. It's never failed once. This Savior has never turned away a coming sinner who cast himself entirely upon the double obedience of Jesus Christ and upon his person. This is a faithful saying. It's worthy of all acceptation. So now you have a gospel of, that's rich in content, but you also have a gospel that is entirely reliable. A gospel that cannot fail. Because God cannot fail. And the Savior is not only man, he's God. He's the unfailable God. It is impossible for Jesus to fail. 
And you see, that's the beauty of the second Adam. The first Adam could still possibly fall, even though he was created for good. The second Adam cannot fall. We are more secure in Christ than Adam was in his good nature pre-fall. And so the necessity of the cross also speaks to us about the reliability of the cross. But then thirdly, the scope of the cross is just amazing. This is a faithful saying, worthy to be accepted of all. Worthy to be accepted of all. No exceptions. No Gentile accepted. No sinner with lots of sins in his closet accepted. You see, you see what Paul is doing. He's saying, I want to encourage those of you who are groaning under the weight of your sin. I want to encourage anyone who thinks, but this salvation cannot be for me. It can be for you. And you are invited to come, just as you are. You know, Spurgeon quite often said in the application of his sermons, you, sinner, you say, why would he ever save me? I say to you, why not? Are you a sinner? Well, your name is right here, Spurgeon would say. Come, just as you are, as a sinner. Come and bring him, all the skeletons in your closet. You see, this text excludes no one, no one sitting in our audience tonight, no one who thinks, but I've got such a bad track record, I've got such a bad heart, he could never save me. He's God, he's almighty. He's able to save the chiefest of sinners. That's what Paul's whole point. Of whom I am chief. If God can save me, Paul is saying, he can save anyone in the world. And if you really believe that, you would be one of the best evangelists in the world. The best evangelists are the Christians who say, if God can save me, there's no hopeless cases with God. He can save anyone. And so Paul comes and says... I want to relieve those of you who are convicted by your unbelieving heart. I want to relieve those of you who are groaning under the burden of your sins. I want to tell you, God himself in Jesus through the cross is the warranty of this gospel. That's why your warrant to come to this Christ, your right to flee to him, to cast your sins upon him, lies in the very character and the nature of the cross and the God the God-man who gave himself to it, and you will find in him total trustworthiness, total acceptation. In fact, the best proof we have that this gospel is trustworthy is the bleeding Emmanuel himself. Come, sinner, come with me to Calvary's cross, Paul is saying. Do you not see the blood of Emmanuel from his head, from his side, from his back, from his hands and feet? Do you not hear his bleeding heart? My God, with a loud voice, my God, why hast thou forsaken me that you might never be forsaken of him when you cast yourself upon him? This is the gospel. This is the necessity of the cross. And this is worthy to be accepted of all. The gospel is so worthy. It's so rich. It's so full. Let the whole world receive it, Paul would say. Timothy, you've received it. You've accepted it by grace. I have too. The Ephesian congregation has accepted it. Oh, that all humanity would believe it, Timothy. Go out and preach the gospel, Timothy. It, tell the people it is worthy of their acceptance. You know, the word accept, I fear, has been too much hijacked by, by Arminians. Actually, the word accept implies something has to be given to you first. You receive what's been given to you. This is the gospel. The gospel God offers his son he gives sinners faith to believe on him so that we as sinners might accept the Father's unspeakable gift and be made willing in the day of his power. In fact, if we don't accept it, 
If we don't know experientially in our souls a total surrender at the feet of this Savior as a poor, hell-worthy sinner, we declare that this gospel is not worthy. And we reject it. We reject not only the invitation, we actually reject the command of God and the demand of God. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. That's not just an invitation. That's a command. Thomas Brooks said, there will be a special place in hell, within hell, reserved for those who have heard the gospel all their life and have refused to accept it. You know, Peter trembled at the thought. He said, what shall be the end of those who obey not the gospel of God? And Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 1 that the same Christ who now stands before you in the garments of the gospel, even in this sermon tonight, will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The necessity and the impossibility of your spiritual condition apart from Jesus Christ ought to compel you and draw you to respond to the invitation and the command and the demand of the gospel that this gospel is worthy to be accepted of all, even of chief sinners. And then fourthly, Paul says, I receive the gospel to be a pattern. Verse 16. Too often we separate verse 16 and 17 from 15, I'm afraid. But I am a pattern of God's long-suffering patience. I'm a pattern for those to come. If God can save me, such a sinner, a rebellious sinner, a persecutor, of the followers of Jesus Christ. If God can make of me such a trophy of his free grace, he can do it for anyone. Anyone. So I'm a pattern, he says, for those to come that Christ might show forth his long suffering, that Christ might boast, as it were, of his power to save the chiefest of sinners, so that those hereafter, look at 16b, those hereafter might believe on him to life everlasting. You know, when I engage in airplane evangelism, which is quite frequent in my life for the last two decades anyway, it's hard to reach people sometimes. But one of the things I found to be The most arresting for people is if I can say to them unselfishly, you know what? I have found this gospel to give me joy and meaning and purpose and direction in life. I found a joy I didn't know outside of it. There's no way for a Christian to not know a more profound joy than someone who's not a Christian because you're in Christ and you live for a purpose so much bigger than you. I, I try to tell that to people. And sometimes, well, they might say something like this. Well, I can see it works for you, but I'm not sure it will work for me. But it gets their interest, you see. And that's what Paul is saying here. I say to people, if God can save me, he can save you. I'll say that directly to them. And you come down beside them. You say, I'm a sinner too. This is what Paul is saying. I, I was a great sinner. I was a chief sinner. God can do it for me. I'm a pattern for you. He can do it for you as well. And then Paul, as he relishes this, this is so beautiful, isn't it? He can't help but break out into doxology. The glory of the gospel is so overwhelming, so overwhelming, that he can't but break out into doxology. The gospel's doxology. Oh, what a, what a beautiful thing it is. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, Invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul wants to amen the gospel in Jesus Christ. Amen the necessity of the cross. Now, he says, not just one day in eternity in heaven, where it will be continuous without break, but now 
Now I want to break out in doxology. Now I, I, I have the grateful love burning in my bones. I, I cannot stay. I, I say with Isaac Watts, we're the whole realm of nature mine, that we're a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. What a gospel, Paul is saying. Christ Jesus, the Lord of glory, comes to save sinners. What a gulf between him and sinners. The one, the king, eternal, the king immortal, the king invisible, the only God, and the other, the chief of sinners. But through the cross, the gulf between the two has been bridged. This king has pardoned rebels. He will never lose his kingdom. He will never abdicate. He will never cease to reign. He will never, never let go of his adopted children. He's the king eternal. He's the king immortal. He gives life to dead souls. He's invisible, yet the Holy Spirit gives us eyes to see him and hearts to trust in him and to rest upon the invisible. He's the only God there is. All the gods of this nations are nothing. But our God, he is the king of kings. So Paul bursts out into worship. The Puritans called it a, a burning white flame in the soul of zeal that spills over the soul. Paul cannot help but be an evangelist to everyone he meets. The necessity of the cross because of the enormity of his sin and the experience of joy that flows out of the cross and his security forever in the cross just makes him break out. He can't hold it back. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A Christian without praise is a miserable man. We ought to be filled with praise Dear children of God, with God, all things are possible. Am I speaking, as I close tonight, am I speaking to perhaps some middle-aged man here, some middle-aged woman, like Paul was middle-aged, and you feel your miserable existence, you feel you know you're a sinner, you know that Jesus is not Savior and Lord in your life, you know he's not number one, you know that he's on the peripheral if he's there at all. Aren't you tired of it? Aren't you tired of the battle with sin? This is a faithful saying. And worthy to be accepted of all. He came to save the likes of you. Trust him. How you say, but if you knew my if you knew who I was, you I agree with Bunyan. I'm the greatest sinner ever. How could he save me? Well, I want to close with a, with a story, an illustration. There was once a young man, true story, a young man who left home. He was a complete rebel, complete failure, rebelled against his parents, gave his parents untold grief, much like the prodigal in Luke 15. And finally, he just left home, Parents didn't even know where he was. And then they heard all kinds of horrible things about him. He was involved in all kinds of sin. And one day God arrested him. And he knew he had to go back to his parents as well as to God. But he said to himself, my parents will never receive me. And God will never receive me. But still, he knew the character of his father and mother. He thought maybe... Maybe they will be merciful, but it seems impossible. So he wrote them a letter, and he said, I'm going to be coming through your area. I'll be coming on a train, and the track went right through their backyard. And he said in the letter, if you have any little corner of your heart that would be willing to show me just a little bit of mercy... Would you just put one white sheet symbolizing peace on the clothesline? And as the train came close 
to the, the old neighborhood. The young man's heart was just pounding so hard. Would there be anything in his father or mother that would show him mercy? He didn't deserve it. That he was sure. And the train came around the corner. Suddenly, he saw white everywhere. White on the clotheslines. White in the trees. Sheets on the roof of the house. Everywhere. It was white, white, white. Welcome home, my son. That, multiplied by a thousand, is what Jesus does on the cross. There was blood for you to make your sins white, to make you white as snow. Come unto him. Repent of your sin. Believe the gospel. Surrender everything to him. Say to him like Esther, if I perish, I perish. But then I will perish at your feet, O Lord. And you will never perish there. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank thee so much for the for the gospel. We thank thee for the enormity of thy grace to superabound over the enormity of our sin. We thank thee that thy righteousness exceeds our unrighteousness. We thank thee, O God, for the good news, the euangelion, that Christ Jesus has come to seek and to save sinners, even chief sinners. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.